Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the great humanitarian chairman and founder of the Dr. Teddy Atlas Foundation, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, good to be with you. Uh, thank you. You're so kind. Uh, so, such a, you know, custom motto. I remember my great mentor, uh, I remember he used to tell me a story that back in the day when he ran the 14th Street Gym uh, in Manhattan. Later on, it was known as the Empire Club, the Gramercy Gym. He gave it to two of my friends, Al Gavin, God bless him, he's not with us anymore, and um, great cut man, by the way, and Bob Jackson, another tremendous trainer and boxing person. And so he gave the gym over to them. But he used to tell me these stories about the gym all the time that he had fighters that were away uh like they'd say in the old days uh, away in college you know <laughs> when they were in jail they were in jail yes and and cuz had a one of them was in the can and he would send guys to stay with cuz when they were maybe on a lamb as they yeah. used to also say <laughs> uh you know you could you can um, define that if you want to, Ken, to the <laughs> listeners out there that might not be up with some of these uh, <clears throat> with some of these sayings. So he would send guys periodically uh, down to Cus to get safe haven, so yeah. to speak, and they would come down. They would come in the gym. They'd say, uh, "Artie sent me." That was all they had to say. Okay, Cus say, "Okay," uh, he turn to one of his guys, he'd say, take him down the corner and get him something to eat. And Cuz had a place down there, a little uh, restaurant down there, where he had a deal with the guy that anyone he sent there could sign, and then at the end of the month, Cuz would take care of it. So he goes down there, this guy, very hard-nosed guy, you know, he wasn't sending, uh, you know, he wasn't sending guys that were trying out for the opera. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. they, they, these were pretty serious guys. So the guy takes them down to the to this place, this restaurant. They're having dinner. And uh, just like you just said something very nice about me, well, Cuz had just done something very nice, obviously, for this guy. He's having a meal. So he's sitting down, he's having a meal. And about a quarter of the way through the meal, he looks up to the guy who brought him there, Cuss's guy, and he says, who does the old man want me to kill? <laughs> <laughs> who do you well, want me to kill, Ken? <clears throat> For no those one, nice no one. To the, okay. co to the contrary, actually, we're obviously still under the uh, corona quarantine, and um, to use some more pri prison terminology, we're all doing like a probably a two to six week bid. And uh, it will be an interesting stretch for a lot of people who are not used to being under any kind of arrest, especially house arrest. But uh, as we've discussed in the previous episode, it's important here that everyone like sticks together. You can't have half the people self-quarantining and everyone else out there acting like there's nothing going on and, and, and infecting someone who has to go out of the house. Then they come home and infect the whole family. So it's kind of one of these situations where we're either all in it together or it isn't going to work. So interesting times here, but it's a good opportunity for us to bring some original content to some of the fight fans who are obviously being starved for um, action, given that every single sport and activity in the world has been canceled or temporarily suspended. So we're going to do our best to deliver the good content, or at least Teddy is, and I'll do my best to shepherd both the process. Are. And again, we, we send our prayers, our thoughts, our well wishes out there to everybody. Yep. To everybody that's uh, goes without saying that's that's dealing with this. Before we get into previewing some of the upcoming fights, I wanted to talk to you briefly about. Um, I know you were just in a did a two week mini camp in um, Staten Island with Alex Vozdik and uh, dying to hear about it. You and I haven't spoken about it at all, so I'm curious to hear about it. And I thought it'd be something that the fans would be interested in hearing about as well. So. Maybe I'll turn it over to you. Tell me how the camp went, what your thoughts are, what the future looks like for Alex, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, we still don't have a definitive date from Alex Vosik's uh, first fight back, you know, for his first fight back since the Better Beer fight, 
which is already five months away uh, in our past already. So rather than to continue to just wait for, you know, wait for his promoter top rank to give us a date, I decided that it'd be responsible to bring him to New York for a two-week mini camp. Uh, he stayed at my house, and we were fortunate enough to have different facilities that were made available to us by people I know on Staten Island. Uh, the College of Staten Island gave us their track facility, their weight room facility, which was awful nice of them. Dr. Piazza, a friend of mine, uh, who's a chiropractor on Staten Island, has a sports science lab. And he opened their doors to us to use their facility. So we had everything we needed. And again, the reason why I did this was so much time had gone by. We still don't have, as I said, a date. I wanted to activate things in my fighter to make sure they didn't they didn't go, you know, into rest mode or in hibernation mode. Things that you don't purposely put into hibernation, like, you know, just that that should be activated that you might not purposely uh think of being put into a hiatus or as i said a hibernation period like just visualizing a fight just just reminding yourself of what what you lost and how you're going to get it back and making sure those juices are still flowing uh after this amount of time and not to let too much more time go by and to do it responsibly, you know, not to do it where one camp would run into the other and then you get overtrained and you'd be in camp too long, but to do a two week dynamic camp where we would really push the limits. And again, for the, for the reasons that we're coming off our first loss, uh, we want to, we, we had not, neither one of us had watched, to better be a fight. We waited till we were going to be together. <clears throat> now we were together. We watched it. We saw what we had to correct. We saw what was good. You see the good. You don't just see the the stuff that is obviously uh, bad stuff or, or not bad stuff, but stuff that obviously uh, you got, you know, overcome with you you see the good things you were doing we were winning a fight going into the 10th round so there was a lot of good things there was a lot of things to take from it um so we saw that too because it could be human nature to only see the bad not to see the good hey wait a minute like when i remember when i had to bring michael moore back from the loss to george foreman the thing that i had to do with that ken was to remind him that he was winning a fight, of course, going into the 10th round, probably winning every round, to be quite frank, in that fight. And so many good things he had done. And then he got caught with the one thing that a great fighter caught him with, a great fighter, not a run-of-the-mill fighter, you know, but, but a, a, a historic fighter, a legendary fighter. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to do some of the same things here, to let him see the good things he had done, not to let his mind be in a place, in a lonely place of only thinking about what we didn't do. But I want to see what we could build on, what we did do, and what we could continue to do, and what we can add to. So I wanted to get that theme out there. I wanted to get that new theme for the next chapter of his life. I wanted to get that started. I didn't want to wait any longer. And I thought it would be responsible to do a two-week camp. And it was uh, the the intent, as I said, was to to correct things, to learn things, to see what we did right, what, what we could continue doing and adding to. Um, it was to get a vision, to get back a vision of what we want to do, what we want to capture, what we want to recapture. Um, and to understand that, not just look at the negative, look at the positive, look at what we learned from it, look at how much better we can be from it. You know, that old saying, there's silver lining in every dark cloud. You know, uh, people say, Teddy, it was a tough fight. Where, where do you see a silver lining? 
We went to places we had never been driven to before. We had never been taken to before. And to know those places now, to understand those places better now, to understand that we could go to them and, and that we can handle those places and how we got to handle those places. Just all those things, just so many things. And I made it a dynamic camp. I made it a a really like a boot camp where... I pushed, we really pushed the limits. We pushed the boundaries purposely, obviously, uh, where we did some things I I wouldn't do that early in a regular camp, Ken, instead of building up to it. He had had come in decent shape, you know. I had him doing stuff in California where he's been maintaining himself, but he wasn't in top shape. We don't want that yet uh, when you go to camp. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to be, ready because then what are you going to do for eight weeks you want to be (laughs) semi-ready so he came to the two-week camp you know not in great shape but in some shape and i really did i really did push the pedal to the metal much more than i normally would uh at such a quick with such a quick time frame uh I, I went old school on him. I I had him running at the track facility uh, and at the football baseball, the baseball facility. I had him running stands. Remember yep. in the old days we run stands? I had him running up the bleachers, up and down, up and down, all the way across the bleachers. I had him running hills where there was a, a hill where you could run a steep hill and then walk it down, run up again, doing that for different reasons, uh, different kind of conditioning reasons. I had him using the equipment in the sports lab I spoke of earlier where they have, uh, you would love this, you're very familiar with this, a high-altitude chamber, a high-altitude apparatus where you can mimic mimic up to 20,000 feet above sea level with the mask where it deprives you of oxygen and you get into a gravity suit where it takes all the pressure off your joints. So the Alter G uh, treadmill? Yes, Alter G. See, I knew my man would know what that is right away. That's a great, that's a great, Great tool to have access to. We had it. We had it, and and it was you know as you know already, uh, it it uh, it's taxing. It's, oh, yeah. it's 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 difficult, you know. And I think he got up to fifteen thousand feet above uh, sea level, and so we, like I said, we were pushing limits. We were uh, we were finding where. I I love when people say they think there's a ceiling on them. Well. Who says there's a ceiling? Why? Because there's supposed to be a ceiling? Who says what that ceiling is? We say. There, there, there's no exact science or universal measurement for a ceiling that, oh, well, you know, that's, if you go to there, you went pretty good. Well, who says you can't, <laughs> the ceiling can't be higher? Who says? Yep. And so we came here to not have a ceiling to find out where we could go, what what our borders are and are not, where, where we could push the boundaries, uh, not just physically but mentally because it's connected. You know, what you're comfortable with is not an indicative marking or barometer of what you're capable of or what your body's capable of. Of course, there's a warning system when your body says uh, it starts to, to feel something and your mind says, okay, that's enough. But who says it's enough? I'm not talking about being irresponsible. I'm of talking course. about finding new boundaries and finding new ceilings, pushing ceilings, <laughs> removing ceilings. The greatest ceiling that we have on ourselves is that we use the word ceiling. <laughs> that that right there, right there you're putting a limit on yourself. Right there you're giving yourself an excuse to stop. You're giving yourself uh, uh, an okay to stop at a certain place. When, when you might find out that you didn't have to stop at that place. Yeah, you went past a comfortable place. But guess what? We go past comfortable places. Uh, that's part of life. That's part of success. That's part of growth. So we came here to grow in certain areas. We came here for two weeks to 
to really, as I said, to to push some of the limits and create create new new places of of you know that were new aims, uh, so to speak, uh, and we. We corrected the mistakes we saw when we watched the tape. We we went to that mode of correcting things. Uh, you know, we corrected them. We worked on them. We worked them on the pads uh, with the body arm. I put the body arm on, which I don't do all the time. And we worked on that. We worked on, uh, again, uh, just, just things that we we know will better us as as a as fighters uh better him as a fighter and we we worked on the mental aspect we did a lot of uh a lot of talking in between where uh understanding what we were feeling at certain times and why we were feeling those things and how those feelings uh may have altered what we were doing may may have uh limited what we were doing may may have stopped what we were doing or uh, influenced what we were doing you know how some of those thoughts uh obviously positive thoughts can be positive and other thoughts can have other impact on you so we we covered everything and as i said at the beginning it was a very intense camp for two mm-hmm. weeks but very successful very successful Good. uh he um you know we we paid attention to diet too in you know uh in a responsible manner the way we would in any camp uh eating the right things uh not quite as worried about weight as as we would in a regular camp but still you know having the same mindset except the last day the last day we had pizza he had never had new york pizza (laughs) <laughs> so 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 the last day we we said you know what that's okay we had a good camp we're gonna have new york pizza and uh i think he enjoyed it i think he had about six seven slices um, i'm not <laughs> sure but it was thin crust it was thin <laughs> crust as they say it was thin crust <clears throat> but um and i'm trying to re- look at my notes here we even at the end of it uh, i waited to the last part of the second week and we had some good people helping us. We used the gym, one of my former foundation uh, boxing gyms that the foundation had subsidized and created actually um, for 10 years. Uh, we no longer do that. The foundation no longer does that, but we we were able to obviously use one of those gyms. We got the key and we used it during the off hours, during the day, so we had privacy. We had everything we needed in, in that facility uh we we had um good people like uh Lou Manfra who who was always there to you know accommodate us in anything that we needed and the last couple of days the last two days of the camp I let him spar uh and I let him spar more than I normally would with a guy lighter uh, they, Lou had his fighter who's a good fighter but who's smaller than us so we worked appropriately but it was still work we still work with a professional fighter and I let him go five rounds the first day and six rounds the second day normally after five month hiatus five months off from a fight I'm not going to start I'm, I'm going to get two full weeks on the floor which we almost had not quite and I'm not going to start with five, six rounds. I'm going to start with four rounds and build yeah. up. But again, it was a different camp. It was a different mindset. We were there for different reasons. You know, we were seeking. We were we were finding things. It was a different sort of uh, mentality. So I let him go five rounds. And again, we, we were working with a fighter who was good enough to work with us, even though he was quite a few pounds lighter. But but a but a fighter who still could give us the work we needed and where we could handcuff ourselves in certain areas of not opening up to take advantage of the weight advantage, but at the same time having to be able to uh, be on top of ourselves and control of ourselves enough where we, we could not have to open up with power, but at the same time do the things we need to do without the other guy 
you know, taking advantage that we're not opening up for power. You, yeah. you still have to be disciplined. You still have to be uh, controlled over what, over the realm of what you need to be controlled over. So we went six rounds and uh, five rounds and six rounds. The sparring went good. Uh, again, the uh, a chance to put to practice the things we worked on for those two weeks right away and before he went home. Mm-hmm. You know, so he, we we accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Uh, we, you know, we um, we got certain. We we cleaned out the attic. <laughs> you know, the attic is the brain, um, and other things. We cleaned the attic out. We we mm-hmm. gave we gave the house a good cleaning, and good. and uh, opened the windows, got <laughs> fresh air in there, you know. And did the things we needed to do. And now what I do is I send them back to California uh, and give them two weeks of rest. Mm-hmm. It might become three weeks. I haven't decided yet. But shut them down for two weeks. Shut them down. And then once we, and then after those two weeks, we'll start back. We'll start back in an appropriate way. You know, when it's a couple, you know, start off a couple of days of proper running, and then some some weights and some other kind of training, but with with the uh, proper with the proper monitoring of what we're doing and spacing of it, where we will do that until we know we have a date, and then once we have a real fixed date, then we can start to plan a regular conventional eight week camp. Uh, once we know we have that date. Well, yeah, this with this quarantine, it'll be interesting to see if and when that date gets announced because, uh, like I said, everything for the foreseeable future has been canceled. I mean, the UFC held an event on Saturday with no fans in attendance, and Dana White claims he's going to keep doing it, but he, he was going to have it at the... Um, UFC uh, Apex Gym in Vegas, but the Nevada State Athletic Commission shut that down. They're they're like, there's no events happening in this state, which I imagine all the other states will follow suit. Um, But with that said, there's some fights on the horizon that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, Starting with one in May 2nd in uh, Manchester, England, Dillian White versus a guy you know very well, Alexander Povetkin, who you've trained in the past. And I'd just like to get your thoughts on that one. Uh, Povetkin obviously been around a long time. Dillian White's a guy that we've been high on on this show for a long time now. Um, What do you think here? What should we be looking for from both guys? Well, first of all, Povetkin, you're right. we We won a world title together. We won a heavyweight title together. Uh, when I was training Perfection for two years. So he's a former world champion and uh, also a former Olympic champion, gold medalist from Russia, representing Russia. Dylan White against Alexander Perfection. Uh Interesting for me, the way I would label it, interesting crossroads fight or possibly the end of the road fight. You know, for for especially Perfection, he's he's forty yep. years old now. So yep. and it's a crossroads fight for Dylan White, because this is it. You know, the funny thing about Dylan White, he was the mandatory challenger for about uh, twenty eight years, right? It was right, <laughs> right. Uh, for about twenty for twenty five years, for ten years, fifteen years, for a long time. I mean, the absurdity, the absurdity of boxing in these organizations. But they had him, and we defended him. We defended him because we defend people that we think need to be defended. We attack people we think need to be attacked. We point fingers and we put lights on people we think have should have fingers pointed and lights shined on them. Yeah, that's what we do. But we defended White because he wasn't being treated right. He, he was the mandatory for way too long, and he never they never gave him his title shot. So now here he is. Now he has it. It's supposed to be his time. That's the first thing I say in evaluating, handicapping this fight for the people out there. It's supposed to be his time. And he's nine years younger. I just said Pavetkin, he's 31. Pavetkin is 40. Uh, the race is supposed to go to the swift and to the young. Well, I don't know if either one of these guys are real swift, but White is young, uh, younger. 
So it's supposed to be his time. But it's interesting. Uh, Perfetkin, he keeps making these paydays, Ken. You got to say one thing about his people. They keep getting him these paydays. And, you know, he's been active, especially at 40 years of age. I made a note to myself to make sure that I that I'm accurate and I remember these things. But he, you know, he, him and his people know there's, there's very little time, if any, left, right? And knowing that, it kind of coincides with what they're doing. This is his third fight in nine months. Uh, and that's a lot for heavyweights nowadays. It really yep. is, especially a 40-year-old one. Uh, as I said, White's nine years younger. He could be up and down with his weight sometimes, a little bit uh, concerning because that can affect his performance. Um, you would think that he's going to be prime and ready for this opportunity. Finally, he's getting it. You would think so. Uh, you know, he's he's a strong, aggressive fighter, good body puncher, Dylan White. I like him. I told you I liked him a while ago on the show. He's He's beaten some good fighters. Uh, as I said, he was a mandatory challenger forever. Uh, and again, now here he is. Here he is. It's supposed to be his moment. It is his moment. What will he make of it? Uh, that's that's what it's going to be all about. Very interesting. For me, the younger white needs to keep the pace. He needs to keep it fast and not allow the older Perfetkin to get into a comfort zone where he's able to, you know, he's able to be able to survive early rounds, you know, because of a slow pace and not really be pushed. And and because then he could make a run for the finish line later. If Pavetkin and 40 can keep it at a slower pace, a more controlled pace, then when it gets you know into those deeper rounds, again he can make a he can make a dash. He can make it to the finish line, yeah. and it's up to the younger White, I think, to keep it at a faster pace that obviously is advantageous to him and disadvantage to Povetkin. Kind of like a car on the road. You got an older car. You don't want it going 70 miles an hour. You want to stay in that lane that goes 40. And that's what Povetkin, I think, wants. Stay in that lane for the first, you know, eight rounds, if you can, 40 miles an hour. Every once in a while, go up to 50. Get back to 40, if you can get away with that. Uh, you don't want to be on the Autobahn. Not with an old car. You don't want to be yeah. on the Autobahn. And so I think it's up to, I think this fight's up to White. I don't say that all the time. I think it's in his hands. I really do. I think it's more in his hands uh, that Dylan White uh, fights the appropriate fight with the appropriate uh, tenacity. Uh, also, as he's being aggressive, go to that old body. He's a pretty good body puncher, Dylan White. Go to yeah. that older body. Wear that older body down. You know, take some of the air out of the tires for later in the fight. And do it while you're not running into right hands. <laughs> that, that is something <laughs> you have to be aware of, you know. You, you don't want to be running into right hands because Povetkin's a good puncher. Uh, he delivers usually with that right hand. He's got a left hook too. But he's he's got a pretty good tricky right hand that I remember showing it to him in the gym when uh, – I started taking over his training and before we fought for the world title, I told him that act as though you're going to your left, like you're slipping over here, and then, boom, just at the last second, loop the right hand a little bit, just a slight loop, but get the guy's eyes to follow your head to the left just to get the opening for that right hand where he gets distracted with your head moving, boom, and then a punch as an opportunity to be really effective. He he does that pretty well. He he learned it and he stayed with it because it worked for him. And that's something that I think White's gotta be aware of. Um one of the storm clouds, because when we're handicapping a fight, we're forecasting something. 
And if you were forecasting the weather, you know, if we were weathermen, one of the things you, that could be a possible storm cloud, I made a note to myself, they have a common opponent. Uh, Marius Wach. And yep. uh, White beat him by decision and Povetkin knocked him out. Now look, styles make fights. That doesn't necessarily mean diddly squat. But it does mean maybe Povetkin punches a little harder for one shot. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe he just caught him right. So he also knocked him out in 2015, and White uh, got the decision in 2019. So a four-year difference for Marius Wach. He could be a completely different person. To your point, not only Styles make fight, but Wach could have been like on the way out and took a last payday against um, against Dillian White. It's a few variables yeah, uh, there. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. To your point, it, it kind of plays to my point a little more. Unless I'm wrong, you have it in front of me, but I think you just said it. Uh, Povetkin fought him when he was younger, so he would have been better then. He would have yep. been more. He would have been. He would have been younger, more youthful. He would have had more in the gas tank, less on Definitely. the odometer. So Povetkin knocked him out at a time when he was supposed to be better. Thirty-one and one, his record was when yeah. he beat him, and, and and he was younger. Yeah. White fights him when he's older, right? How many years later did White fight him? Quite a Four few. Four years later, and he was 35 and 5. So he basically hadn't had a lot of wins after Povetkin knocked him out. So so he fights him at a... So White fights him at a lesser time in his career, at a weaker time in his career, at a more, at a more um, vulnerable time in his career, and he goes the distance with him. Povetkin fights him at a at a better time in his career where he's supposed to be at his best, and he knocks him out. So that could be a little bit of your handicapping, and you're saying the 40-year-old Povetkin, you're just going to figure that Dylan White's going to win. That might give you a little something to think about. Oh, yeah. And, and he had been, and Walk had been knocked out twice after Povetkin knocked him out, losing three fights, going three and three before he got to Dillian White, where he all ultimately lost the unanimous decision. So, yeah, to your point, Povetkin's win over him probably means a lot more than uh, Dillian White's win. Yeah, I think so. And, and look, Povetkin's now in a position of being in the heavyweight division. You got him in all the divisions. You always have this. He's in a position of being that stepping stone guy. Yes, gatekeeper. Gatekeeper, beautiful. Uh, where you got to get past this guy to to get the title fight or to get the uh, mandatory or in this case to to get the you know whatever version of the title this is for. Uh, I don't know if it's for the vacated or the interim or the silver or gold or platinum or the pearl. The pearl or uh, I don't know what it is. Um, it's the interim, but it's I don't even know how they have an interim belt when you have a reigning champion in Tyson Fury who just beat the reigning champion in Deontay Wilder. What 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 is this with all the belts? Interim? I mean, I was under the impression interim is when someone's injured, can't defend the belt, you don't want to strip them, you know. So he's an interim title until the real champ is ready to go. <laughs> you got to you make me laugh, Ken. I mean, you're, you're talking like it's supposed to make sense. This is boxing, <laughs> Ken. Ken. Come on, shopping up here. Fair this point, is boxing. Fair point. This is boxing. They they want to get another. They they want to be able to get another sanctioning fee. I mean, fair. that's what it is. Come yep. on, intern, well, member, intern, intern, extern, uh, litter turn, uh, whatever. It it doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. They it all in the end. They make it into something that makes sense for them. It doesn't yep. matter. Well, speaking of the heavyweight division, um, one of uh, Dillian White's former opponents, Derek Chisora, is in action on May 23rd against Alexander Usyk, who we both really like. Obviously, same manager as Alex Vozdik. And um, 
former cruiserweight unified champ, world boxing super series champ, gold medalist. Usyk has it all. The guy is like on fire. He's you know just has just um, scored his first heavyweight victory in the last couple months in Chicago. So now he's going up against Derek Chisora, who's been in there with a lot of people. Hasn't beaten a lot of top guys, but is considered a um, top tier heavyweight or at least a top of the second tier let's say um but he's a stalwart it's been around for a while what are you looking for there interesting interesting um i you know i know it's about you know where the money is i mean you you go where you have to go to make the maximum money and what money dictates that most of the time uh where you're gonna fight but you got to give Usyk credit that he goes and fights Trezora at a new weight, you know, heavyweight, um, uh, you know, a, a legitimate guy. He, he goes and fights him in the other guy's country or the country yep. that he's living in, yep. in, in uh, London. So you got to you gotta give him credit for the – but it, it fits right in with Usyk, confident guy. Uh, you know, we're not talking about a guy that doesn't have reason to be confident here and believe that he could win anywhere that he fights. This is a guy who consolidated all the titles at Cruiserweight, put them all together, won all of them. This is a guy who's an Olympic gold medalist. This is a guy who's in the same stable as Lomachenko, maybe the number one fighter in the world, depending on where you put him, one or two, him and Crawford. You know, or you could put Canelo in there, I guess. But you know, he, he's arguably the one of, if not the number one fighter in the world, number one, two or three. Uh, not too many people can argue with that, no matter what their taste is, of preferences. But he's in that, you know, he's in that stable. As my fighter uh, Alexander Vosik also is in that stable, pretty damn good stable. Uh, it's an interesting. It's Usyk's second. It's his second uh, time in the heavyweight pool, where this one is a little bit more in the deep end. Maybe a lot yep. more in the deep end. I mean, the first time that he put his foot in the heavyweight pool was with Witherspoon, uh, you know, and Witherspoon was not as credible. I mean. At all, uh, at that at this point when he fought him, he had been inactive. He had, you know, uh, he was not the kind of threat that Trezora can be. Uh, but there's a life preserver floating nearby. Trezora is 36 years old. Uh, he does have a lot of miles on the odometer. You know, Usyk picking him. He they're not dumb. Uh, they pick him because he's a credible guy in the heavyweights. But also, they have to have some edges. You know, there has to be some reason to also pick him. He's got eight losses. Uh, he can be hot and cold. Uh, obviously, Usyk's people are hoping that he's cold on this day, right? Yep. Uh, it, it, you know, it's a test in the heavyweight waters, but with the, the edges and style he needs. Chisora is flat-footed. And in front of you, although he is strong and usually aggressive, um, he can punch a bit. He He's very experienced. But Usyk can counter that. You know, he's got the good legs. He's younger. Uh, as I said, he's he's got the experience too and obviously the confidence. Uh, he's... As I said earlier, he's not an undefeated unified cruiserweight champion and Olympic gold medalist for nothing. Obviously, uh, this is a guy that I believe can win the heavyweight title. I mean, this yeah. is a guy that I said that when his name first showed up on a roster uh, for attendance, when they were taking new attendance in the heavyweight ranks. Oh, there's a new guy here. Who's this? Alexander Yusik. Oh. You're in the heavyweights now. Yes. And right away I said, hey, this guy is a guy that I think will wind up finding the right spot, the right time, and 
being able to have a very good chance to do something that uh, very few people do. Go from cruiserweight to heavyweight and be crowned a world champion, you know, yeah. the way Holyfield did, uh, you know, many years ago when he moved up and people thought he was too small. And people forget, people say now, oh, but the heavyweights are bigger now, Ted. They're bigger now. You know, Usyk, that size disadvantage is going to come up. It's, it's going to hurt him. Hey, I got news for you. Everyone said the same thing when Holyfield went up to heavyweight. They were pretty big. Look at Lennox Lewis. Was he small? Was he a midget? He wasn't small. He wasn't a, a scrawny heavyweight. He was a big heavyweight. Lennox Lewis was, if he was fighting still today, he'd be a big heavyweight. Yep. And, you know, and Holyfield was able to compete with guys like him. Uh, obviously, he won the title from Buster Douglas, who was a big heavyweight, who yep. was coming off the high of beating Tyson. And obviously, Holyfield caught him at a low, uh, not being as prepared as he was for the Tyson fight. But still, Holyfield had to do what he had to do. It wasn't given to him. You know, he had to go in there and still execute against a big guy, a talented guy uh, at a foreign weight that he had never been at before. So, again, I see Usyk, I see it as an interesting fight. I see the advantages that Usyk has stepping up and picking this guy. But I also see the legitimacy in this as being a legitimate test with uh, Trezora, with the experience, the background that he has, the size, the strength, the power, the the ability to be aggressive. Uh, I just happen to think that at the end of the day, Usyk will win the fight by unanimous decision or possibly, possibly, uh, as Trezora possibly slows down in the late stages of the fight, possibly get a stoppage. Yeah, but um, I I just I, I like the character of Usyk. I like I just like everything about him. I like his ability. I like uh, the way he goes about it, uh, the way he uses his ability, uh, the way that he does things when he has to in an intelligent way. Uh, you know, his as I said, his inner strength of belief. He's got a great personality too. I like him as a person. Really nice guy. I think he's a good guy. I think he's a decent yeah. human being. Very good. Um, all right, that brings us to the last one I wanted to discuss. Um, also scheduled for uh, May 2nd, like the Dillian White-Povetkin fight, is uh, Canelo Alvarez and Billy Joe Saunders. Billy Joe Saunders, 29-0 and with 14 knockouts. Didn't look great in his last fight. This won't be at super middleweight. Canelo coming off the light heavyweight victory over... Um, Kovalev, he won the WBO title there, and uh, so Canelo looking to get his first legitimate title at super middleweight. Um, this will be interesting, especially though, as for the way Saunders looked in his last fight. Curious to hear what you think about this one, though. Yeah, interesting. Um, I've been using that word a little bit. Yeah, uh, last couple of times. Interesting but, times we're in. Yes, and you're an interesting man. <laughs> It's my only marketable skill. You're a very interesting I'm man. Trying. And a good person. The first thing that I'm going to say, does anybody, this fight's being projected, tell me if I'm wrong, but it's not a set date, I don't think, but it's being projected for Las Vegas, May 2nd, during Cinco de, de Mayo. Am, am I correct? Yes. My producer, yes. our producer, and you yourself are shaking your heads. Yes. All right, here's my first question. When I handicap something, when I give my perspective on something, I try to do it from inside out. Inside out. Uh, you know, look at everything. Not just the, the, the most obvious things to look at. And the first thing I say before we get into breaking down styles and, you know, all that, does anyone <laughs> does anyone actually think that the biggest pay-per-view draw in the sport, who happens to be Canelo, is not going to get a decision if it goes to a decision against a fighter from England 
fighting in Las Vegas on Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> and if, if somebody does think that, really, if they do, first of all, where did you park your spaceship? Because I want to go look at it. I've always wanted to see a spaceship. I always have, Ken. Really, a real spaceship. I want to see it. So let me know where it is. I'm sure you put some leaves over it, some branches over it. I'll put them <laughs> back on top after I look. I promise. I'll place them all back on top so nobody will find it. Um, because boxing doesn't work that way, okay? It's not always fair and honest. I'm not saying that Billy Joe's going to beat him. I'm not going to say it's competitive. I'm not go even talking about that right now. But if it was to go to a decision... That was competitive. Come on. Come on. <laughs> really? You'd think that there's any shot. Las Vegas would not even put a lineup on that. Believe me that uh, he's going to get a fair shake. But having said that, I'm going to throw in an X factor before I go into the serious breakdown of the fight. The X factor, first of all, Canelo looked tremendous in his last fight against uh, that guy, whatever his Kovalev. name is, Kovalev. Kovalev, a guy that, you know, let's be fair here. Let's be fair here. I mean, in our last episode, we spoke about the problems, the legal problems of Brona, correct? Exactly. Yeah, so let's be fair. That's Since we did... And and we, you know, it's a shame. We hate to see guys hurting themselves and not correcting those things and not learning from past, you know. And he has blown in trouble again with DWI and, you know, it, it's a serious thing. Hey, Kovalev just had the same situation, didn't he, Ken? He's got some very, very serious allegations being made against him, beating up a woman who, 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 who denied his sexual advances. Allegedly, these are allegations, but if it is true, she posted some pictures of what he allegedly did to her, and it does not look good. If, in fact, he did that, he's got some serious problems, and he's got some serious consequences to face. I just want to be fair, because, you uh, know, no, really, you. because I I'm care about, I really do care about that, being fair. We talked about Brona, you brought it up about Brona, and it was right, because it's out there. It's and out we've there. About, and we've talked about Tank Davis, who, unlike Kovalev, a another is one. on videotape doing this, and someone Terrible. on Twitter said to me, what about Kovalev? I said, he's facing allegations. If, in fact, he's convicted of that, that's a different conversation. But that person's right to bring it up. What about yeah. Kovalev? They're right. And that's why I'm bringing it up, because it's fair. And and I believe he just got arrested for a DWI, too. I think so, yeah. yeah. Three weeks ago in L.A. Well, Rob is confirming it. Three weeks ago in L.A. So we can't talk about Broner doing these bad things, stupid things, th things that are serious. You could kill somebody, DUI. Uh, we can't talk about that and, that and then talk about, you know, mention Kovalev and not talk about that. You're right. Oh, so there it is. Um, moving past that, I'm going to throw in there that Canelo, as good as he looked, and he looked good in that fight. He broke down Kovalev, the bigger guy, but he looked like the bigger guy. Canelo yeah. looked like the bigger guy, the stronger guy. He didn't look like the middleweight moving up to fight a, you know, a light heavyweight. He looked like the light heavyweight. And he looked like he had the impact of a light heavyweight by the time it got uh, and uh, the destruction of a light heavyweight uh, by the time he got to those late rounds where he stopped Kovalev the way he stopped him. Uh, he looked good. He looked good. He looked solid. He looked strong. The X factor here, because he's going to be a probably a prohibitive favorite against uh, Billy Joe Saunders. The X factor here, I think, again, I don't think this is going to be brought up. And, and it doesn't mean that it's, it only means it's worth bringing it up because in my mind, anything that's possible that could have an influence is worth bringing up if it's possible. It makes me think a little bit and I'm not saying it's going to happen. At the end of the day, I'm picking. I'm. I'm going to jump the gun 
and I'm going to tell you I'm picking Alvarez. But what I'm saying as an X factor, remember years ago when the great Roy Jones was beating everybody? Yep. And and same weight, uh, light heavyweight. He was beating everybody. Well, now, of course, Alvarez is dropping back down to super middleweight, I believe, for this fight. But Roy Jones was beating everybody. Speed, power, boxing ability, timing, reflexes, confidence. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he was tremendous, tremendous. And what does he do? He decides to do something historic. He goes up and puts weight up and goes up to fight John Ruiz, who had one of the heavyweight titles. He goes up and he fights Ruiz for the heavyweight title. He wins it, wins a decision, which nobody talks about because I guess they didn't think much of Ruiz, but it's still a hell of an accomplishment. But he goes up, he beats Ruiz. I'm saying it right, right? It was John Ruiz, wasn't it? John Ruiz, yeah. I was at, I yeah. was at that fight. John well, Ruiz from, from Somerville. Boston, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It makes sense that that you would be interested in that. So he goes he goes up, he beats Ruiz for a version of one of the heavyweight titles that Ruiz has. And then he comes back down after gaining that weight and you know winning the fight. He comes back down to his natural place of light heavyweight and he's never the same. He's never the same. Look, it could be other things. He got beat by some good fighters. I'm taking nothing away from the because he got beat by a couple of really good fighters. Uh, and he was getting older. And all those things could have conspired against him. But the fact is, he came back down in weight after going up, and he was never the same. It affected him to some level. I'm just wondering if going up and down a little bit with Alvarez... Now, Alvarez is younger, uh, and he's not going up as significant. The, the weight gain is not as much. But I'm just wondering if that has impact on him physiologically at some point in his career. That's an X factor out there. I'm just putting it out there. That's all. But having said that and doing my job to put everything out there, uh, I think, I'm going to say that Billy Joe Saunders represents to me an overachiever. He represents a guy who doesn't have the greatest of talent. He has good talent, but he's not great in one area. But he's solid in all areas. There's not one area you can say he's bad. Oh, he yeah. stinks in that area. No, he's solid in all areas, but he's not great. He doesn't have great ability. Canelo, you could say, has great talents in certain areas. That he's, that he's a really good puncher. He's a really good body puncher. You know, you could pick you could pick something where you say he's really extraordinary in that area. Saunders isn't that guy. He's a guy that's well-rounded. He's a guy that, again, an overachiever, we like to call those guys. Blue-collar guy. Uh, a guy who's technically sound. I'm giving him credit. I'm not taking away from him. I'm just yeah. making points. He's a guy that uh, he crosses his T's, he dots his I's when it comes to his approach. He does everything the right way from a technical standpoint. He's good. Yep. Yeah. Um, he has not fought the caliber or shown that he can fight the caliber that Canelo has fought. So for all those reasons, you got to favor Canelo, obviously, and the, and the bookmakers are going to tell you that. It's going to be indicative of what it's going to, you know, what the line's going to be on a, on a and, and he's traveling. And he's traveling, as we just said. I think that there's also an up and down psychologically, Ken, where you, it's not just physical that Canelo has gone up and comes down and there could be an impact on his performance, an impact on his body. I think when you go up to fight such historic fights, such big fights, and then you come down, that there can be an impact mentally where you where you don't where you get flat. Where you can get a little flat. Where you you go up, you get up, 
for this big accomplishment and, you know, and all the other big fights that he's been in. He's been in so many big fights. You know, the Triple G fights, of course, that weren't all that long ago, uh, you know, at middleweight. And now you go up and you win the light every way. You come back down. You're fighting a guy that you expected to beat, right? And yep. psychologically, you can, you can have... You can have a little bit of a pitfall. You, you can you can have a little bit of uh, just just a fallout to that. There can be a fallout to that, to where you you're not able to get up. You think you're up, but you're not quite able to get up to that mental place that you were able to get up before because of the ups and downs, and you get a little flat. I think that could be another X factor in this fight that's something that you have to look at uh having said all that i think saunders will give him a much more competitive tougher fight with everything i just said with the skill levels being on the side of canelo the more skillful guy and the guy who has fought the better competition the guy that knows he can handle that competition that means something too knowing what you can do versus finding out what you might be able to do or hope you can do, I think Billy Joe Saunders is going to give him a hell of a fight. I think he's going to give him a tough fight. I think he's going to give him a strategic fight. I think that he's going to be ready for what he has to be ready for and that it's it's going to be competitive going into the late rounds and tough. Yeah. I think that Canelo will need to be on his A game of body punching. Jabs to control and stabilize Billy Joe on the outside. Strong jab. He's got a good jab, Canelo. Uh, to the chest. Stabilize Billy Joe so he doesn't pot shot him and navigate the outside so easily. He's He's got to take that away from him. But then he's got to really pinpoint that body. Those right hands, left hooks to the body. Take take the air out of the tires of Billy Joel. Wear him down. Welcome welcome him to the big leagues. Yeah. At Cinco de Mayo. Welcome <laughs> to the big leagues during Cinco de Mayo, Mr. Saunders. And and, and you guys across the pond, how are you doing? I haven't sent my love out to you recently. I send it. Love you guys. Just want to make sure I'm not remiss in doing that. Always, always, you're never far, you're never far from my thoughts. Never. I mean, how could you be far from my thoughts? I have a damn dartboard downstairs in my basement <laughs> that just set me with my freaking face on it. <laughs> how could you be far from my thoughts, from my heart? How? <laughs> and there's been no darts put in that board, by the way. None. <laughs> and there never will be. There never will be. But it will be there with me. I love it. It's a big part of of my collection. It means a lot to me. It really does. But it will never have a dot in it. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. All right? Okay. Having gotten that out of the way, I think that the fight, if it goes the way that I believe it goes and the way that Canelo and the bookmakers who are putting the lines in place think it's going to go, it goes towards Canelo being in a tough fight and down the stretch having to, you know, continue to bang at that body, bang at that drum. You know, like the old timers said, chop, chop, you know, chop downstairs and the tree will fall. The tree will yeah. finally fall. That's got to be his approach. Slow him down, discourage him a little bit change his rhythm by using that jab, by banging to the body and being able to, I think, maybe maybe even get a decision, if not a late round stoppage, but a decision against uh, a guy that, again, I, I think Billy Joe Saunders is a guy that uh, gets the most out of his ability. He's going to have to get everything to win this fight, everything out of it. But Canelo does give you moments. He does give you hope. Where does he give you hope, Teddy? He gives you hope where he's not the busiest guy. It's not like he's throwing 100 punches around. 
you know, and I'm just throwing that out as an arbitrary number. But he's he's using his jab, he's throwing the right punches, using the uppercut at the right time, going to the body, you know, he's doing his thing. But he's not a guy who's, you know, who's constantly spitting punches out every second. He gives you he gives you lulls, he gives you moments, he gives you reprieves a little bit. You know, he puts some pressure on you. It's fairly, but but it's it's not uh, a pressure that's closing the gaps all the time. There, there's there's a certain pause that gives you a chance to get a little bit of a pit stop, if you will, every once in a while. So because of all that, I'm going to say that it's going to be a good fight. One of the interesting things, and maybe Rob can check it. I don't off the top of your head. Do you, has has Canelo ever been knocked down? To, do you know? I, I don't think he has. I can't recall him being knocked down. And the reason I mention is because Saunders is twenty nine and zero, but he only has fourteen knockouts. And um, Canelo obviously has a hell of a beard. And twenty nine and zero with fourteen knockouts doesn't doesn't um, speak volumes of Saunders' ability to put someone away. So to that point, I I think don't even he, need that stat. To your point, and that's a great point, a great point that you bring that up, but I don't even need that stat. Rob's on it right now, but I don't even need it because I already know Canelo's got a hell of a chin. Yep. Canelo's got a, but go ahead. Did you find anything, Rob? Yeah, officially Canelo has never been knocked down in a pro fight. Uh, Jose Cotto did knock him down where the ropes held him up. All right, so you heard that? Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the Jose Cotto is Miguel Cotto's brother. He, he's not as good as Miguel. Miguel was yeah, a world no, champion. No. Jose Jose was not a world champion. but um, So he's never been knocked out. But I didn't even need that because you know when a guy's got a good chin, you know. You know, and he's got a hell of a chin. He's got, you know, he's got a, he got hit some good shots by Golovkin, uh, who's He's been in there, Canelo, though, to your point, he's been in there with everyone from Floyd Mayweather, Triple G, Kovalev. I mean, go down the list. Everyone he fights is a, like, household name, more or less. And, um, you know, to never been knocked down with a a legitimate knockdown against all those guys, Billy Joe's going to have to bring his A game. But like you said, Billy Joe is not a slouch, so I, I think Canelo gets up for this on Cinco de Mayo, and I think um, I, I get the argument that um, Saunders could put up a good fight, but I think Canelo is going to run him over. Let's let's see what happens. Yeah, but. he listen. He might, let me let me let me put one other thing in there. While the there's a opportunity to put it in there, I want to say that one of the things that I'm most impressed about Canelo, uh, and and listen, I'm going to make sure as I say this, I'm going to also say that I thought he lost both fights to Triple G. I'm going to be consistent. I'm not going back, you know, on revisionist history here. I don't know. I, because now you could, because Golovkin, I think, is a little shot now, and... Uh, he's not the same fighter anymore, and I don't. I think that those miles on his odometer, those tough fights, plus those 400 amateur fights, it's catching up to him at his age. And his he's past what he's past his best. Put it that way. Uh, Triple G. I know a lot of people that fans is they won't like to hear that, but anyway, that's what I feel. But I felt that Golovkin won both those fights. Uh, and he got cheated out of the draw and, of course, the loss in the last fight. But having said that, one of the things that I'm most impressed with about Canelo and where he is and why he's where he is is that he steadily continued, even after big money fights, even after signature fights, formative fights, he continued to get better, Ken. He continued to improve. I got to take my hat off to his trainer or trainers. I don't know if it's one guy or two guys. I don't remember. But I got to take my hat off to them. You know, I talk about in the last episode about how there's been a light exposed where we don't have enough good teachers out there. When you see guys like Wilder and and Kanaki and, you know, these guys that just don't learn, were never taught the fundamentals of boxing. And But 
I also at the same time now have to say and recognize when there are good trainers out there, like Canelo's people, like Crawford's people, like Lomachenko's people. I mean, they're doing a hell of a job, all those people. And in this case, Canelo, they had a fighter where you could get stagnant. You could get stagnant in your improvement where you don't get better because you're making money, because you're in these big fights. And Canelo continued to get better where Golovkin did not. That was the separating point for me with the two. Golovkin, over those years, he kept winning on his force, on his relentlessness, his natural desire to win, his you know, obviously all the experience he had, he was a civil medalist from the Olympics, his power, his physicality, his determination. He continued to, to win on that, but I never saw an improvement in the other areas. Canelo continued to improve, continued to add, to get better. Even now, even now. His trainer is uh, Eddie Reynoso. Renoso, who's a well-known guy. And um, so, you know, again, like they like in the Godfather movie, I salute Eddie Renoso. Uh, <laughs> I salute. Uh, you've done a great job. Remember that guy, the Turk? Yeah. The guy, uh, uh, so what was his name? Uh, he was, he... Robert get it for me. But when they were in the meeting with uh, Don Corleone and he he said, uh, what was, what the heck? Salazza. Sal How could I forget Salazza? How do I forget <laughs> Salazza? Salazza said, I salute Don Corleone. I salute hey. Eddie Reynoso. You've done a great job. Um, and again, that's, to me, that's what, that's what really impresses me about Canelo is that he he continue he always has the right fight plan he had the right fight plan you know for for the last fight when he went up to light heavyweight uh he he also uh listen don't any of you haters out there don't throw the mayweather fight at me don't throw that at me do not okay i know he lost every round I know how many years ago that was, but I know he lost every round to a special fighter, Mayweather, a fighter where you could actually say the styles uh, were not conducive at all uh, for Canelo in that fight. A lot of people would say he was too slow and they wouldn't be wrong, but I don't think his hands were too slow in that fight. I think his feet were too slow. He was also 23 years old in yeah, there against yeah, like a wily yeah. old veteran. Exactly. Hey, listen, but even that 23 can be misleading. He's a kid that turned pro when he was 16. That's right. So he already, so he already had seven years pro experience. But listen, I, I it, it was, it's only fair game. Somebody's going to throw it at me. So I'm going to hit it before they throw it at me. You know, I'm going to tackle it right away. And yeah, Floyd's a special guy. Uh, in that fight, the styles were not suitable for Canelo. And again, I don't think it was his hands were too slow in that fight with Floyd. I think his feet were too slow because with Floyd, especially that Floyd, that was a younger Floyd, uh, he, he not only had the great defensive head movements and timing where he could time you like he timed. He, he made adjustments. When he got older against Pacquiao, what did he do? He timed Pacquiao the softball with right hands. Boom! He yeah. just timed them right. With other guys, you know, he'd give the shoulder roll. Other guys, you know, he'd make you miss, he counter. But when he was younger, he also used his legs. And yeah. when he used his legs, it wasn't enough just to have quick hands. You had to have quick feet to close the gap quick enough to be able to close the distance, to get to him quick enough, to deliver to him, uh, to the target. And Canelo wasn't able to do that. That yeah. was part of the problem. Besides, he was in there with a difficult style and a great fighter. So anyway, I just, I just wanted to really give proper kudos and props to Canelo and his people for what I recognize as 
Yeah, it's not just that he's a great pay-per-view guy and he gets all the money pay-per-view and he's got the great Latino audience behind him and, and all that. But And he's tough and he's physical and all that. But he kept learning. Yeah. You know, and like I said, he always came, except with the Mayweather fight, he always came with the right game plan. And something that I noticed, obviously, with Lomachenko, but I also noticed with Crawford. His people, he's got a couple trainers there. He's got a head trainer, and he's got a couple trainers. They do a magnificent job, Crawford's people, of not only preparing him every day in the gym as far as giving him his, the core base of what he needs for good technique and just good boxing IQ, so to speak, handling all of that in general, but they always have the right game plan or yeah. fight plan. Always. Yeah. They always have the right fight plan, which is so important when you're at that level. Yeah. Well, very good. That was a thorough uh, analysis of all these fights. And uh, again... Corona quarantine still in effect here. So please, if you like the show, subscribe, leave a review, share the links, whatever. We'll keep trying to bring you some original content during this, um, tr during these trying times. And um, like we said at the beginning, everyone, please be safe, take care of each other. And uh, Teddy, you got anything before we sign off? No, just what you said, what we said in the last episode, what we said this episode, that we're going through difficult times, scary times right now, and care about each other. You know, that word care has never been more important, has never okay. been more needed than now. Care about each other. Care about your fellow human being and respect each other. You know, Ken touched on it earlier. Don't be fighting in shopping centers over, you know, who's grabbing the last, the last case of water or whatever. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know, just be grateful that you you live in a country, in such a country that can give you the resources to battle uh, such a such a virus, and does give uh, look out for you and give you the best chance to be protected and for your family to be protected. There's people that live in certain parts of the world right now; they don't have that. I mean, as, as scary as it is for us. Think about what it is for some of the people that were not fortunate enough to be living in this country with everything that's provided here. Think about how scary it is for them. Quite yep. frankly, how scary it is for them all the time. Yep. Not just at a time like this, that's which right. is a very difficult time. So all I say is that, you know, care about each other and, and take care of your families and your fellow neighbor and your fellow human being the best you can and, you know, and... And everybody be smart. Use good common sense. Yep, we'll get through this. And as we do, like I said, we'll continue to try to bring you some entertainment during this um, during the downtime here. So thanks again for being with us. Appreciate all the support. And uh, we'll speak soon. Thanks, Teddy. 